crowning jewel is none other than the museum. It is so revolutionary to the series that many fans were more excited for the museum than anything else new in the game. Hold up, haven't we done this bit already? Oh yeah, back in part one. If you haven't seen it, you should, and it will just be right there. But if you already have, let's go ahead and fast forward to right where we left off. All right, let's go ahead and continue into the next room where we see the survivors. Right off the bat, what I love most about this room is how much closer it is to our time. When looking at the creatures in the previous rooms, it's really hard to imagine that they ever led to the life on Earth as we know it. In a way, they almost seem alien or mythological, not the relatives of the birds we hear right outside our window in the morning. But when you walk in here, even though these guys have been extinct for a few thousand years, you can relate them to the animals you know and love today. There's an elephant. Here's a big cat. Right there, that's a rhino. Here's a deer, and that looks pretty close to a human skull. And the evolutionary tree here in general is a lot more interesting to examine, as you see splits coming off of splits in this crazy organized mess that is life. And in the end, each of these lines eventually lead to the very animals you interact with in-game. You can look up at them and go, hey, there's Norma, I love that cow, or that mouse is definitely Cheddar, my absolute favorite. Looking at all these lines, you can see how your villagers connect to each other and to the fossils. And, at the very end here, by going underneath this light, you complete the tree. You connect yourself to all the other animals in this game. So, as I examined all these lines and their connections, I got to wondering, how accurate is this tree, and do the symbols on it actually stand in for something real? So I did some research, and I found that this tree is fairly accurate, and the symbols on it do stand in for something real. So let's talk about what the symbols do mean. Starting from the beginning, I'm going to go ahead and skip the eagle, since it doesn't really connect to this crazy web over here that I really want to look at. Instead, I'm going to look at this big line that does connect to it. And this label right here is for the class Mammalia, which every animal here falls under. They are all mammals. Following that line, our first split will lead us to the kangaroo and koala. And the label here could be either for their subclass or order. And for the duration of this video, I'm not going to bother with trying to say the super scientific term for classes or orders. Instead, I'm just going to say what the name basically means, and on screen I'll write the scientific term. Of course, the subclass for these guys would be marsupials, which for the most part is any animal that carries its young in a pouch. However, the order name for koalas and kangaroos refers to the two large front teeth on their bottom jaw, which it's kind of funny to think of 1800s scientists and explorer outfits opening up marsupials mouths trying to classify them. Like, oh, we got two large front teeth on the bottom jaw over here, put it in that order. <laughs> but um, in reality, they probably just looked at bones or some sort of chart. And if we go back to the split and follow the other line, we have this label, which is for the suborder of placental mammals. The placenta basically just helps in maintaining growth of a fetus instead of doing something like an egg where they already have to have their nutrients all built in or whatever the heck marsupials are doing. At the end of this line, there are anteaters, elephants, and mammoths, which from my searching, I couldn't find a classification they all fell under. So I think this label would probably say the nosely ones, but you know, in like Latin or something, as they all have a very prominent nose, unlike the other animals, and likely shared a common ancestor. But too many changes have happened since that ancestor to put them all in like an order together. However, moving up, we do have an order with this label for the mammoth and elephant, which refers to their trunk or nose. Going back to the other path, we once again have another label with no scientific connection, so I chose to call it those that most definitely abstain from an oversized proboscis, otherwise known as the no-noses or the small schnauzers. 
which these no-noses are split into two different groups that I also couldn't find a scientific classification for. And I promise, after this, there will be a scientific base naming, but for these two, I made up my own names. The bear, pig, and deer side, I'm gonna go with the name Lesser Tested, and for the mouse and monkey side, I'm going to go with the name Greater Tested. And this refers to animals being used for lab testing. The rodent primate side is used a lot more for testing since their anatomy, such as their organ placements and how their hormones behave, are closer to humans than the other side. So they are used a lot more for testing since their bodies will probably have the same reactions that ours do. When the other side is used for testing, it's for more general biology research, so whatever animal is most convenient is probably the one used. And that's where the other domesticated animals kind of come into testing. And sorry to bring up animal testing, it's kind of a downer, but that's the solid difference I could find between the two. So, on the lesser tested side, on the left we split into the order of carnivores, which splits again, this time into super families, with cat-like on the left and dog-like on the right. Of course, you know which side the dog and cat would fall under. And the saber-toothed tiger is cat, and the bear is under dog. Which, when I'm told that, I can see that a bear is more like a dog than like a cat. But when I think dog, bear does not even come close. <laughs> Although, walrus is also in this super family, so dog-like encompasses a lot, apparently. Going back to the right path of the lesser tested, we have another label that does not correlate with an order, but the classification that fits the best is hooved mammals, which I found very interesting. With the other split being carnivores, I thought this one would be herbivores. And as I got thinking about it, technically, you could call the other side clawed animals, if this one's hooved animals. And either way, it makes sense. If it was carnivore and herbivore, or clawed and hoofed, because those that hunt for food would develop feet that help them with hunting, and those that ran from being food would develop feet that help them run faster. So, it makes sense. Anyway, back to the hoofs. On the left, we have the order of the odd toe hoofs. With the rhino, it's easy to see the three toes, but the horse? I'm, I'm not sure. I know for a fact, one toe bears most of the weight in the hoof. I also know, because it's in this group, that it has an odd number of toes. But I'll leave it to you to figure out if that's five, three, or one toe, and where all the toes are located. And that label to the right is just the family name for rhinoceroses, which the Megaloceros was. Coming back down to follow the left fork, if we have odd-toed hooves, then on this side we gotta have even-toed hooves, which I think more commonly we think of them as cloven hooves. Like that you find on cows, pigs, all that fancy stuff. Going up another level, there's this label, and I'm, once again, not sure what to put here. Ten years ago, they classified the hippo and the pig in the same superfamily, so it would have had made sense to link the two and label them together. But now hippos are in the same suborder as whales, which are apparently in the even-toe order. So I decay how a hippo, cow, and deer are connected. The hippo and pig were connected because they both had simple stomachs. But yeah, I don't know how a hippo is closer to a cow and a deer than to a pig, or how any of that works. I don't know if the scientific community has completely figured it out yet. I don't know. I couldn't find much on it. And I'm not even gonna try and give it a fake name, because, yeah, I just don't know what they're going for at all there. And that brings us to our next label, which is a suborder for hoofed mammals that have three or four chambers to their stomach, such as the deer cow. And the last label on this branch is for a family classified based on if they have antlers. So this is like your deer, caribou, reindeer, all that fun stuff. Which the deer and megalo do in fact have antlers. Hmm. I never really thought about that this fossil is male. You never really think about bones having sex, but they do. 
I wonder if they display female skeletons of extinct deer in museums. I mean, they wouldn't stand out as much. The antlers are definitely more impressive. Anyway, I'm <laughs> totally off track. Let's go way back down and look at our greater tested side. Looking to the left, we have a label leading up to the mouse and rabbit that I once again don't know. Man, I feel like it sounds like I don't know more than I do know. <sighs> but I feel like when I look at my table of things that I labeled, I had more than half labeled. So why does it sound like I know nothing? I know something. <laughs> anyway, so looking at it, you would think that a rabbit and a mouse would be just straight up classified as rodents, but apparently they belong in different orders based on their teeth. And I couldn't find any sort of classification that put them together, but I'm assuming they're linked here with a label because like they do look pretty close to each other, so they probably did share some closer relative back there somewhere, just like the anteater and elephant did. So I will deem them the super order Fluffy Floof! Scientific community, you can get back to me on that one. We can talk it over, get that down in Latin or something. Just let me know. We can figure it out. Also, if all these groups that I didn't know do have official names and I just suck at research, please let me know and I'll put any corrections in the description. Thank you. And following that other fork, we have the label that I actually know and I'm sure you guys do too. And it's primates, which is an order. And us weirdos with grasping hands and big fat brains belong to this order. And the very last label is for the genus Homo, which us Homo sapiens are the very last of the Homos. And a mammal is placed in this classification if they walk on two legs and have sophisticated tool use, among the other primate features. And our skull friend right there, Australopithecus, is currently theorized to be the ancestor of the Homo line. And with that, we have answered the questions. The tree is pretty dang accurate, and the labels do stand in for something real. Although, for some of them, I'm not sure what that real thing is, but I can tell there is some sort of distinctions in the groups they've like labeled off. The next question I had when seeing this room was, who's missing in the silhouettes, and where would they go? So, there are 35 species of villagers in total, yet there are only 17 present here. So, let's give a quick shout out to those missing. First off, we are missing every animal that is not a mammal besides the eagle. I think they wanted some sort of way to connect all the dinosaurs in the other room to the modern animal now. And so they put the eagle here for a placeholder, but for the most part, their focus in this room was mammals. Seeing that all the other groups and I got their turn. So, let's talk our non-mammalian friends. There's octopus, ostrich, bird, penguin, alligator, duck, chicken, and frog. And most of these are some sort of bird. And if the developers had put them on the tree, they would all come off the dinosaur line just like the eagle. With the birds placed, we still have octopus, alligator, and frog left. If the octopus was at it, there would be a long line stretching all the way back to the cephalopods on the left side in the first room. The frog, on the other hand, would come from the right side, breaking off from a relative of Acanthostega. As for the alligator, their line would probably come off this split right here, as they share a closer common ancestor with dinosaurs than they do with turtles. Now for our mammals, I'll just place them as we go along the line. For our marsupials and our nosies, we don't have any other animals to add. But when coming to the cat, tigers and lions, which are indeed carnivores and cat-like, would join the line there. The dog-like wolf villagers would of course link up with the dog. Cubs would be in the same place as the bears, since it's just a younger version. But I do wonder how they would do that. A cub on the bear's shoulders would definitely be super cute, but would be too tall also. The cow has the sheep and goat as part of their family, which is kind of interesting since I only ever hear about the cow having multiple stomachs, but not sheep, goats, or deer. But I guess we do eat more cows than the others. 
So humans are more intimate with the insides of cows than with goats or sheep. But why not deer that more people probably personally butcher than any other animal? Ah, oh, who knows. Anyway, the bull would also go here as it's a male version of the cow. And I think it's pretty funny that they have a separate category for them. They don't do that for the male and female deer, despite having different models. But I guess the deer were new to New Leaf, so maybe the models got better? But what about male kangaroos? They have a different model. And kangaroos have been around since the first game, so... I think the male kangaroos might have been new to New Leaf. One sec. Okay, I just did a search and they were in fact new to New Leaf. And I totally knew that at one point. But I totally forgot. I guess back before New Leaf? They couldn't have a very different model without it being like a whole new species classification. I wonder if that's why in New Leaf we got a lot more interesting models and like fun villager like quirks and types inside of types. Like imagine to have Julian the unicorn instead of just placing him under the horse category they had to make a whole new like category for unicorns. Anyway. <laughs> I'm totally off topic, I just- that was just a tangent that I'm interested in things. Okay. <laughs> the squirrel and hamster are actually rodents and would be in the same order as the mouse. And lastly, as a primate, gorillas would be linked on this line. And since they are a greater ape, they would probably be linked closer to humans than they would be to the monkey. And with that, my thoughts and questions on this here museum have been thoroughly explored. Let me know if there was anything you were wondering. Also, while making this, I was thinking about where NPCs would fit on this tree. So if you want to see that, let me know. And to figure out all these connections, actually use the handy dandy cork board I made in the video I'm going to link right up there. So check that out. Anyway, I just love the museum. I think it's so wonderful and I hope after all this you learn something interesting and that you'll never look at the museum the same again. Thank you so much for watching and have the loveliest of day. And this is Shroomy signing off.